Matt Rempe gets ejected for the third time against the Devils. As the Rangers and Devils get into a game-opening 5v5 brawl, the Rangers rally for a 4-3 win, and Alexi Lafreniere and Capo Caco both have big nights for the Rangers. You're locked on the New York Rangers, your daily podcast on the New York Rangers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, Blue Shirts fans, to episode number 1040 of the Locked On New York Rangers podcast. I'm your host, John Chick. Just want to thank you guys, as always, for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. And we are, of course, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So quite the game here between the Rangers and Devils. You had a 5v5 brawl to start the game, and then sooner or later, a hockey game broke out, and uh, quite the hockey game it was. Obviously, Rangers going up two goals, giving it away, coming back to win the game in the third period in dramatic fashion, 4-3, and obviously dealing the Devils a tremendous blow to you know whatever hopes they have of still making the playoffs. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the episode, but I really don't think I can talk for a second farther here without talking about what else? The opening brawl to start this game. Every once in a while, you'll see one of these line fights to start a game. Rangers have been involved in a couple over the years. Very rarely do you see, I think, all five players on the ice drop the gloves and get into an actual fist fight. Now, of course, there's instances where, you know, there's there's a skirmish and everybody's involved, or maybe there's one fight that, that's like an actual fight where guys are dropping the gloves and everybody else kind of pairs off and just kind of, you know, tussles with with their opponent or whatever it might be. But uh, this was uh, this was a 5v5 fight. There's no other way to say it. Maybe I'm a little bit naive. I really didn't see this happening in this game. You know, the line fight from, I, I want to say it was 2012, between these same two teams, the Rangers and Devils, uh, that one you could kind of sense was about to go down because it had gotten really nasty between those two teams that season. Uh, there was some bad blood. There was... Uh, you know, some things that had happened in a couple of prior games that led you to believe that this certainly was a possibility, if not a probability. You know, the, the line fight to start the game back in 2012. It's funny because Mike Rupp was in the uh, in the audience for this game. And they interviewed him about it. And uh, he was involved in that very fight, you know, 12 years ago against the Devils. And, you know, Tortorella and Peter DeBoer were at each other's throats at that time. The animosity between these two teams was at an all-time high at that point, I would say. And I don't say that lightly because we've seen the temperature uh, rise pretty high between these two franchises over the years. I mean, you could go back to 94, and obviously it was a fiercely competitive rivalry then. And, of course, we all know what happened in the Eastern Conference Finals. But, again, that fight, you know, about 12 years ago, I want to say 2012, you could sense that it was about to happen. Uh, and also, just two years ago, or I guess uh, it'd be three years ago now, you knew for sure this thing was going to go down at the start of the Rangers Capitals game because obviously we had that situation where Tom Wilson basically assaulted our Timmy Panarin and just doing Tom Wilson things. And then those two teams, as fate would have it, were playing each other. I want to say uh, two nights later, or maybe just a game later, a night later, whatever it was. Um, but you knew that that game was going to start with a fight. This one, I didn't really see it coming. Now, obviously, once I saw that Rempe and McDermott were on the ice, it's kind of like, okay, yeah, th this is clearly going to happen. And you could see the two of them were uh, exchanging pleasantries, shall we say, before the uh, the puck dropped for the opening faceoff. And both of them kind of getting into position. You knew as soon as that puck dropped it, the two of them were going to drop gloves. And before the faceoff happened, there was actually uh, one of the referees was saying something to the two of, to the two of them. And I want to say he was probably reminding them that they have to wait until, until the puck drops because if you fight before the faceoff, uh, the repercussions are quite a bit bigger. I want to say you get uh, ejected from that game. But anyway, the puck drops, and the next thing you know, uh, you see VZ. He gets into the first fight, and, you know, uh, away we go. The next thing you know, it's a, a 5v5 fight. And again, I knew that, you know, Matt Rempe being on the ice here and McDermott being out there, certainly the two of them were going to fight. 5v5, again, maybe I'm a little naive, didn't see it coming this time around, and quite the uh, quite the scene at Madison Square Garden to you know start this night. And I'm going to break down you know everything that I saw, everything that happened during all these fights in just a couple of minutes here. 
First, though, I think we need to back up and just go to the decision to put Matt Rempe back into this lineup in the first place. Because obviously, Rempe had been a healthy scratch for the last three games. And of course, some of those games are against teams like the Avalanche, the Coyotes, uh, teams that you're not necessarily expecting there to be any trouble. Um, you never know. I mean, it doesn't take much. Any, anything can kind of light the fuse, an Eastern Conference team versus a Western Conference team. But I don't think there's like a history of animosity between those franchises. I know Rangers and Avalanche fans go back and forth about who's the better defenseman between Fox and McCarr. But um, as far as the, the teams themselves, I don't think there's anything uh, too serious. But as far as like why I was on board with Matt Rempe getting back into the lineup, first of all, it was probably time. Once again, he had been a healthy scratch for three games in a row, and you are coming off of a loss, and uh, coaches are more willing to mess with the lineup following a loss than they would be after a win. On top of that, this is a rivalry game where just generally speaking, you're expecting some trouble, some fisticuffs, some nastiness, and obviously we got that exactly two seconds into this game. And on top of that, you know, we're still trying to figure out who's going to be in the lineup game one of the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs for the Rangers. And obviously, it could go either way with Rempe. Uh, my best bet is that he will be out there, but you got to sooner or later allow him to kind of stake his claim to that spot in the game one starting lineup, or not necessarily starting lineup, but the lineup in general. So he's got to get out there and get some more reps. And obviously, he's very inexperienced. I believe this was about his 14th game or so in the NHL. But the biggest reason why I felt it was the right choice to go with Matt Rempe is because there's obviously the history there. And obviously, Matt Rempe had a very bad hit against the Devils in the last game. McDermott wanted to fight him. It didn't happen. And, you know, Rempe was ejected from that game. So to me, it's a situation where if you're the Rangers, I think in a way you kind of have to make Rempe available to the Devils. You've got to allow the Devils to kind of get their shot at him, so to speak. I mean, to me, that's kind of the code of conduct here. I mean, maybe I'm off with this. Um, I guess you could see it from the other point of view. Maybe if the Devils look over and see the Ranger lineup and they see that Matt Rempe is back in the lineup after being a healthy scratch for three straight games, then maybe they start thinking like, okay, that's an act of aggression by the Rangers, and that means they're coming after us, and they're out for blood, and we got to be ready to go, and let's just fight them when the puck drops. So I can see it from both points of view, but to me, the Rangers had to put Matt Rempe out there, make him available, and uh, I mean, it was going to be McDermott, obviously, so allow McDermott the opportunity to fight Matt Rempe, and that's what they did. I mean, imagine if a couple of years ago, you know, Rangers and Capitals, I'll use that example again, imagine if you know, everything that happened with Tom Wilson in the first game happened and he's ragdolling Panarin and assaulting the Rangers star player. And then the Capitals turn around in the next game and make Tom Wilson a healthy scratch against the Rangers. That would not have gone down well with any of us. I think a lot of us would have been furious. Now, it's a little bit different because Tom Wilson's a more established player in the league than obviously Matt Rempe is. But I think the same, you know, line of thinking still applies here. The Rangers had to put Matt Rempe out there. Fair is fair. The Devils wanted their shot at him. They got their shot at him. And, um, you know, obviously uh, it wasn't just Rempe. It was a 5v5 fight to start this game. So just a crazy scene. The other kind of subplot here that gets lost in the mix of all this craziness is that the odd man out for the Rangers, at least for this game, was Johnny Brodzinski. For a while, it was looking like it might be Will Cooley because at practice, uh, when they had the line combinations, Cooley was kind of skating as the extra, and Brodzinski was, you know, among the 12 forwards that it looked like we're going to play in this game. And I didn't think it would be Cooley, but when you kind of remember what happened in the Penguin game, it made at least a little bit of sense because the Penguins' third goal came off of a turnover by Cooley. Rangers were down two to nothing, and obviously they're trying to create some offense, and it's the third period, and Cooley's got the puck just inside the Penguin blue line. He's trying to hold the zone, but the Penguins are able to knock the puck away from him. It uh, leads to a breakaway. Penguins score to go up 3 nothing. So it was looking like that mistake might cost Cooley, and he might be the odd man out for this game. Uh, that obviously did not um, turn out to be the case. Instead, it's Brodzinski, and Brodzinski, you know, it's, it's tough because I don't feel like he's played poorly. I don't think he's done anything to lose his job his spot in the lineup, but facts are facts right now. It's just a numbers game. There are 12 forward positions and there's 13 guys that are gunning for those spots. And obviously, uh, you know, there's a good amount of Ranger forwards that you know are going to be out there every single night. There's only so many guys that are really even candidates uh, to be the odd man out and be the healthy scratch. Johnny Brodzinski is one of them. And again, I don't think he really did anything wrong, but that's just kind of the way it goes right now. You know, regardless of what the Ranger lineup is, there's going to be at least one player who's the odd man out and kind of undeservedly so because I don't think any Ranger forward is really playing all that poorly right now where they 
uh, deserve to sit. So we're going to keep everything rolling in just a second. We're going to break down the actual fights in just a second. going to give some props to Alexi Lafreniere and Capo Caco for each having strong games in this one and, and leading the Rangers to this win. First, though, we definitely would like to let everybody know that today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by Robinhood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirements with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of quarter one 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So let's go ahead and keep everything rolling here. Uh, the actual fights, there were five of them. It was kind of hard to know where to look. Obviously, I, I think the TV producer clearly has uh, their hands full when dealing with a situation such as this because which camera do you go to? Which fight is the most intense, the, the craziest? I mean, good luck with that. So anyway, the puck drops, away we go. Um, obviously, you know, Rempe and McDermott were, were chirping each other before uh, the puck ever dropped here. So it was pretty obvious that they were going to fight. Uh, McDermott landed some early punches, but I, I think Rempe kind of rallied in the second half. And uh, I'd call this one maybe a draw. I mean, it, it's hard to say for sure. It's hard to say for sure because, again, watching this on TV, we didn't see the entirety of any of the five fights. I am willing to give Keandre Miller the win over Marino. I, I think that one was pretty obvious. Um, that was kind of crazy. You know, Miller was kind of tossing him around and uh, obviously landed some punches. Uh, Miller had Marino down on the ice and kind of had his fist back, but fought the better of, uh, you know, continuing to wail away on him. Um, and that's good. You know, once somebody's down the ice and basically defenseless, um, better to, to lay off. You don't want to be cheap shotting anybody and, um, you know, doing something that certainly uh, your opponents would remember at that point. It was kind of funny, though, because once that fight was broken up and they were being escorted to the penalty box, Keandre Miller kind of held out his hand and held it kind of close to the ice, you know, kind of telling Marino, you know, you're, you're not big enough to, to take on me. So um, kind of a humorous moment there in, in the middle of all this. You also had Barclay Goodrow against Ball. And the thing here that was kind of funny, and this is kind of what led to the ejections and more on that in a second, but the puck drops, the fights begin, and Barclay Goodrow skates away from the Devil's Center and goes and finds Ball instead and decides to fight him. And I'm not really sure why he did this other than like maybe like a subtle middle finger, just like, you're not even worth my time. I'm going to go fight this guy over here. I'm going to take on one of the you know bigger guys on the ice, one of the tougher guys on the ice. I don't know. You'd have to ask Barclay Goodrow uh, for sure as far as, uh, you know, his line of thinking there. Um, but again, you know, at this point, the camera's cutting back to McDermott and Rempe. And again, I thought McDermott had the early edge and Rempe kind of rallied a little bit. This fight lasted longer than any of the rest of them. Um, this one just kind of went on and on and on until both guys were tired and eventually the refs, uh, you know, broke up the fight. And that's another thing. I mean, really think about the situation the refs are in here. You've got five fights, five fights, and there are four officials. And at first glance, it's like, well, you know, they're, you know, send one ref to every fight, right? And there's only one extra one at that point. But to really properly break up a fight, you need two referees because if, if there's two guys fighting and only one ref is trying to break it up and he grabs him, I mean, he's basically become the other guy's tag team partner, because now you're holding uh, the guy that you're fighting. So uh, obviously they had their hands full in this situation. I, I think they did the best they could. The other, you know, somewhat humorous moment that we saw in the middle of all this is all these fights are happening and the camera for a second cuts to Igor 
And I know that like some people were getting on, uh, you know, the network for cutting to Igor while these fights are happening. But Igor Shosturkin is basically picking up all the equipment on his side of the ice because obviously, you know, everybody had dropped their stick, dropped their gloves. Uh, there's debris everywhere. And Igor, uh, you know, obviously uh, doing a little uh, housekeeping there. And um, never made a move towards center ice, did Igor Shosturkin. We know Igor can get a little feisty out there. Uh, I, for one, am very glad that hopefully that thought never even occurred to him as far as, you know, going down and, and taking on, um, you know, the devil's goalie. Uh, I think about the last thing Ranger fans need or want to see at this point in the season is for Igor Shosturkin to get into a goalie fight. No thank you on that. So I'm glad that he uh, chose to sit this one out. But yeah, I mean, eventually all the fights die down. You've got Matt Rempe, you know, he tends to play to the crowd a little bit. He was waving his arms uh, to the crowd. You had Laviolette and Green yelling at each other on the bench. And, you know, eventually they went their separate ways. And then Laviolette went back for more. Uh, Green was saying some things. Green said something. I mean, you don't have to be an expert lip reader to know what Green said to Laviolette. It was uh, it was three words. There was a swear word right in the middle of the three words. I can't repeat it because I like my job here, but um, you guys can certainly fill in the blanks there. Um, and then you've got the penalty box cameras, and there's five guys in both penalty boxes. And then, you know, I'm, I'm trying to watch the replay. You know, they, they replay it a couple of times. And again, it's hard to show everything. And even when they do show everything, you know, they have a camera where you can see the entire rink. It's hard to kind of process everything that's going on as far as the five fights are concerned. So I'm watching that. And obviously there's some fans there in attendance and a bunch of them, you know, they pull out their camera phones and they're recording things. So I've tried to watch this, you know, this brawl from every conceivable angle. And I probably still haven't seen everything that went down. But what was interesting here, is that four players from each team got ejected from this game uh, once the fighting had stopped. Initially, you know, all five guys from both teams went to the penalty boxes and, um, you know, they, they were going to serve their five minutes. But then came the ruling from the officials that because VZ and, uh, who was VZ? Lazar. He was matched up with Lazar. Because those two dropped the gloves first and got into the first fight, because that happened before any of the other fights, technically... Uh, everybody else was guilty of an infraction where if you get into a fight after the initial fight, then you are ejected from the game. So uh, roll call here. The Devils lose Ball, Marino, Tierney, and McDermott. Uh, the Rangers lose Rempe, Truba, Miller, and Goodrow. VZ and Lazar both got to stay in the penalty box and got to uh, finish this game once their five minutes were up. Uh, so here's a stat for you. Um, we you know, dive into different stats on this uh, on this podcast every now and then. Here's one that is unlike any other that I've ever uh, given. And we're on episode, what is this, 1,040 now. Rempe has now played three games against the Devils. He has been ejected all three times. The first game, he played 13 seconds. The second game, 448. So, uh, uh, I mean, for him, that that's like an Ironman kind of a night, you know, when, when the Rangers are playing the Devils. And then, of course, this game last night, two seconds. So, in total, uh, Matt Rempe has played in three games against the Devils, five minutes and three seconds of time spent on the ice. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just crazy. The, the PA announcer had his hands full announcing all the penalties. He was talking for about 10 straight minutes, you know, once the, the puck went live again and we actually had a hockey game to play. Um, and then, you know, there was another fight after this and you're starting to wonder, is this going to be one of those nights where it's just fighting and fighting and fighting? We had uh, Cooley against Mercer. It's a big hit by Cooley on Smith behind the net. And, and Cooley has laid, you know, some pretty punishing hits on some players this season. And um, a lot of times, you know, opposing players have gone after him. I think part of the reason for that is he's young and he's a rookie. This one, though, you know, he did get Smith from behind. We got to be fair here. Uh, boarding penalty was assessed. It was nullified because Mercer uh, was the instigator here. But basically, you know, and Smith did kind of turn, you know, somewhat late. But uh, Cooley uh, probably had time to stop, put him into the boards anyway. And uh, Mercer jumps him. And away we go again. Uh, this fight was pretty even. Again, Mercer gets the instigator. He's gone for 17 minutes. And, I mean, you could see how much, you know, not just at this point, but really for the entire night, uh, how much open space there was on both benches. Um, you know, you, you, uh, <laughs> it is what it is. You just kind of got to adjust on the fly. And obviously both teams are down to four defensemen. And, you know, you got to go, both teams now down two forwards and two D-men for the rest of the game, or three forwards and two D-men. And a thought that I had watching this, too, was that this is a good way to kind of uh, get Eric Gustafson back into the swing of things because, you know, Laviolette has said in recent history, once a player is cleared to return from injury, uh, that will indeed be what happens. You know, they'll be out there, there won't be any restrictions, and they'll play and play and play their usual, um, you know, 
time allotment that they would play under normal circumstances. But Gustafson in this game, he actually ends up with a team high 29 minutes and 42 seconds. Uh, he was also a minus one, three shots on goal, two hits. I think he did all right. And he, by the way, is also your unsung hero for the game. When you come back from injury and you got to play almost half an hour and uh, you hold up as well as he did. I mean, the Rangers only had four defensemen and they still held the Devils scoreless in the first and third periods. I know, you know, the Devils got three in the second period, but overall, I thought the Ranger D-men uh, held up well under some difficult circumstances here. So uh, we're going to keep everything wrong in just a second. I do also have an idea for the postseason play as far as what the lineup should look like. And I do want to give some props to Alexi Lafreniere and Capo Caco. We're going to do that and a whole bunch of other stuff in just a second. But first, definitely want to let everybody know that today's episode of Locked on New York Rangers is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you will always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you are burning rubber and not cash. With all the parts you need at all the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home those huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Okay, so I had an idea for the playoffs. You know, we were just talking about Gustafson a second ago, and, you know, obviously he's back in the lineup, and there's some... You know, fans that are upset about that, I'll, you know, make him the healthy stretch, leave Zach Jones is in, into the lineup. And I get where people are coming from when they say that. There's people that want to make Truba the healthy scratch. That's not going to happen. Let's give Truba a little chance to get back into the swing of things. This is only his third game back. And for all intents and purposes, he did not actually play in this game, you know, save for that game opening fight. Uh, my idea for the playoffs, and, and again, we, we could pretty much assume and make it a slam dunk that the top five defensemen on this team are going to be in the lineup uh, night, in, night in and night out on the playoffs. So my idea, as far as the sixth defenseman spot is concerned, I tweeted this out during the day yesterday before all the chaos happened. You have Gustafson and Jones. There's seven games left, including last night. You have Gustafson and Jones alternate every single game in and out of the lineup uh, down the home stretch here. Now, I don't really expect the Rangers to do that, but my point of view is that that's about as fair as it gets, is it not? I mean, there's two defensemen here that are both you know, willing and, and able and capable of being the sixth defenseman for the Rangers when the puck drops for game one of the playoffs. And one of them's not going to get the chance to do that. And that's unfortunate, but I do think that's about as fair of a way to sell the score as you can possibly have. Uh, Jones, you know, handled it pretty well when, um, or very well, really, when, when he was told that he was not going to be in the lineup, he had some uh, quotes about this, that obviously he's being mature. And I see some people saying, oh man, get ready to say goodbye to Zach Jones. He's going to demand a trade in the off season. I've said recently, I think Zach Jones is your number six defenseman on opening night next year because Eric Gustafson is a free agent after the year. I'd be open to the idea of the Rangers re-signing him. I think overall, you know, he can be really up and down, but I think overall he's had a solid season for the Rangers and one of the better number six defensemen that they've had. I mean, there's been quite the revolving door there in recent seasons. So if they were able to come to an agreement, I I'd be okay with that. But I think the Rangers will probably look at what Zach Jones has done this year and say, yeah, you know what? That's our sixth defenseman next season. And then... As far as like a seventh defenseman, I mean, it could be somebody like maybe Brandon Scanlon, you know, somebody that's on the Hartford Wolfpack right now, or maybe just like a veteran journeyman that you bring in and, uh, you know, have them play that role. But I do think Jones is out there opening night uh, for this upcoming season, but only time will tell there. Um, as far as, uh, you know, the, the rest of this game, there were kind of some funny quotes after this game. Uh, Peter LaViolette talking to Adam Fox on the bench. So Adam Fox asked uh, Peter LaViolette, because I guess he didn't know what the ruling was after that fight had happened. He asked, and both defensemen got kicked out, and LaViolette's response to Adam Fox was, yep, 30 minutes, basically telling Fox uh, how much he was going to play in that game. Also, uh, you might be interested to know this. LaViolette revealed that the emergency defenseman for the Rangers in this game uh, would have actually been Mika Zibanejad if one of the forwards had to move from forward and go back to playing defenseman. I've always thought, you know, over the years that if the Rangers needed an emergency forward, it would probably be Ke'Andre Miller because obviously that's the position uh, that he played in college. I never really gave a lot of thought to what would happen if they needed an extra defenseman because you really just don't expect to be in a spot like that. 
Um, playing with four defensemen is manageable, and the Rangers obviously managed that, you know, as well as they could in this game last night. But like, if one of them were to get hurt or something, now you're down to three defensemen. I mean, you'd have to have, if, if you only go with those three guys, you know, playing the blue line, they'd all have to be out there for about 40 minutes, and that's getting a little crazy. So, um, yeah, I, I think you know, if anything had happened to uh, one of the other Ranger defensemen, I'm glad it didn't, but it would have been, it would have really been a sight to see. Uh, Mika Zibanejad lining up as a defenseman for the rest of this game. That would have been quite the the sight to behold. Um, you know, one of the positive side effects, I, I think, from all this insanity and the fighting and the craziness here is that I do feel like this is the kind of thing that can just bring a, a team that much closer together. And I'm not, you know, saying that this is the kind of thing that should happen every night. I'm not, like, an advocate for brawling every single game. You know, there's people that think that, like, this is what hockey is, and I disagree with that. I think fighting is a part of hockey, um, I, I don't think it's certainly as big a part as it used to be. It's probably for the better that it's not as big a part as it used to be because things like this, when, when teams would just brawl like this and there'd be everybody on the ice would be fighting and guys would actually leave the bench and there'd be benches clearing brawls, uh, they are very, very rare now. And, and that's a good thing. You don't need to be seeing this kind of thing every single night. But I also, on the flip side of that, I don't mind when the NHL gets a, you know, a quick call back to its roots, if you will, because again, this stuff to, used to be really commonplace. And of course, I don't want to see anybody get a concussion, uh, break bones in their face or, or anything like that, or, you know, have uh, all kinds of problems after they retire, you know, post, post-concussion post syndrome or CTE or anything along those lines. Um, a fight like this, though, every once in a while, I mean, it is what it is. It's going to happen every once in a blue moon. I mentioned the other Ranger brawls that they've been involved in over the last, you know, handful, of, I mean, not even handful, it's a good amount of seasons. Basically, this has happened to the Rangers now three times in the last 12 years. It doesn't happen that often. Um, if it stays at that rate, then, you know, so be it. I, I don't think it's the end of the world either. Um, but, yeah, um, that that's pretty much it as far as the fighting is concerned. I do want to, at the end of the episode here, once again, give some props to Alexi Lafreniere, Capo Caco, them stepping up big. Uh, Lafreniere coming through with two points. Uh, he made a great play on the Rangers' first goal of the game because, Obviously, you know, there, there was a shot. It, the rebound goes to Lafreniere, and Lafreniere is in prime position to shoot the puck here. I mean, he's right in front of the net, and I'm thinking, you know, shoot. I'm thinking he's going to put it right back in the net and very possibly score. But Lafreniere saw Panarin to his left. I mean, Panarin's wide open, and as soon as Lafreniere chose to make this pass, it was basically a 100% chance that it was going to be a goal because the net was wide open for Panarin. Panarin was in deep. I mean, in what world does he not bury this shot, right, especially this season? So that makes it one and nothing. And then the tail end of a power play, I uh, do not believe this went into the books as a power play goal, but the second unit for the Rangers is out there. And I, I do think they've they've shown some signs of life recently. They don't get a ton of ice time on the power play, but they tend to make the most of it. Uh, really nice play by Jack Rosovic. And I, I feel like he kind of needed a moment like this. Um, you know, he, he came over and at first he was kind of adding a speed dimension to that top line. I feel like recently he's been uh, just not very noticeable really at all. Um, but in this case, you know, the Rangers are applying some pressure. Rosovic races to the puck and uh, zips around up the left side along the boards, gets around a defender, goes behind the net, uses that speed to his advantage, backhand pass in front to Wenberg. Uh, Wenberg, his shot kind of got through the goalie, but not all the way, and, and Lafreniere is, a, is there to uh, sweep at home, give the Rangers a 2-0 lead. Then, of course, you know, we got the Devils rallying. They go 3-2 in the second, and another third-period comeback win for the Rangers. You've got uh, Luke Hughes breaking his stick, and just a great play by Capo Caco. He's picking it up. Uh, Hughes is chasing him with no stick. He's on him, uh, but Caco you know, slightly up the left side and just a laser of a shot into the far side of the net. And what did I say not too long ago? Capo Caco, I mean, first of all, he's picking it up just in general, you know, five-game point streak here. Um, but, you know, scoring goals in a variety of different ways from different spots on the ice, different you know situations in the game. And right here, uh, this to me was the most encouraging uh, goal that Capo Caco has scored recently because he beat the goalie clean. And that's something that we've talked about off and on with Lafreniere and Caco since they've come into the league. Uh, you know, for, for years there, there just weren't enough examples of the two of them just beating the goalie clean. Now, we've seen Lafreniere do it a bunch of times this season, and that's awesome. Caco, not quite as much, but nice to see that, you know, he's able to do that in a spot like this. Uh, again, just being the goalie clean and a big spot in the game, tying the game. Capo Caco after the game, uh, being asked about Capo Kakonen, the uh, you know the, the goalie for the Devils. There uh, is what Caco had to say. He's from the same city as me, same first name. Also, nice guy. Never change, Caco. That that's 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 an awesome quote. Um, and then we get uh, Chris Kreider winning the game for the Rangers. Obviously, they're on the power play. Panarin moves the puck back to Fox. Fox with a shot from uh, this is more of a pass. I mean, sort of might 
technically be a shot, but uh, if, if nothing else, he was shooting uh, with the idea that, that Kreider was going to deflect it here. And I, I do consider this more of a pass than a shot. Kreider was there in front. Uh, perfect pass, perfect deflection by Kreider. Four to three, uh, Rangers win the game. And with that, they sweep the Devils on the season. Four and zero against them this year. And look, I mean, that playoff series last year did not go the Ranger way. It, it, was, it was terrible. It was a bitter pill to swallow. And it's in the books. There, there's nothing we can do about it now. But I think... You know, the best, uh, the mess, you know, remedy for that is doing exactly what the Rangers did this season, going 4-0 against the Devils. And hey, I mean, that's eight points that the Devils could have, in theory, gotten against the Rangers. You know, if the Devils go 4-0 against the Rangers, that's four points. Um, they didn't get any of those points. So the Devils could really use all eight of those points, or at least some of those eight points right now, as they're on the outside of the playoff uh, picture looking in. They're now six points out of the playoffs. 13th place in the Eastern Conference and just a lot of teams in front of them that they would have to jump. And obviously, uh, you know, the Devils ended the Rangers season last year, but man, the Rangers really, uh, this this could be the dagger for the Devils and Devils aren't even going to get into the playoffs if things stay uh, the way that they are. And something else I just want to point out here, 25 comeback wins this season for the Rangers. That includes an NHL best 13 third period comeback wins. Something, something, no heart, something, something. Somebody will say that. Somebody will be in the comment section talking about how this Ranger team has no heart. And of course, look, the second period was not good. It's not ideal that the Rangers had a multi-goal lead and let it evaporate, but they came back. They won the game. They found a way to get the job done. And I do think, you know, the ability to come back, come from behind and win games, very good trait to have, you know, once you're into the Stanley Cup playoffs. Uh, that'll pretty much do it for today. Just six games left. That's it, guys. we got six games left and then hopefully a whole bunch more Stanley Cup playoff games. Again, the Rangers are going to play every other night to close out the season. Friday is at Detroit. And again, it's another desperate team. Another really good test for the Rangers. The Red Wings right now currently tied with the Capitals for the final playoff spot. Uh, the Capitals do have a game in hand. But either way, you're going to be matched up against a very desperate Detroit Red Wings team. And uh, I think that's a, a good type of team for the Rangers to be playing. Because, of course, the Rangers, they know they're going to the playoffs. Um, but this is a good test right here. Get used to a team that's basically going to be out there playing a, a Game 7 style of, uh, of hockey on Friday night. So definitely looking forward to that and seeing how the Rangers can do. Uh, that will do it for today, though, guys. Once again, if you'd like to get in touch with this podcast, please send an email to LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Once again, that is LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Definitely give us a follow on Twitter as well, at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. Once again, that is at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. And definitely subscribe to the Locked On New York Rangers YouTube channel. Thanks again, guys. I will see you next time.